one thing that undergraduate students uh, keep asking me, or or I know, or I have a feeling that they're not very sure of, is what is a PhD? Uh, how does a great, how does grad school work, and all that? So today I wanted to cover that a bit. Uh, I wanted to go through a few, um, basically a summary of what's the objective of a PhD. Uh, why should you decide to do it in CS? Um, I will also talk a bit about my own uh, research group. Uh, so what is a PhD? Um, PhD is, as you probably already know, is a, an academic degree where you must uh, master and advance the state of the art. Um, the meaning of PhD is Doctor of Philosophy, and it is the highest academic degree um, you can get. It is rare, so there is uh, only 5%, around 5% of population has it. Um, and so for some reason, for some people, it is uh, a, cert, uh, a sense of pride to get it. Um, as you can see here, this is how many people have, for instance, a bachelor's, a master's, uh, and a PhD. Uh, and you can actually see that there's been more people. There's been a growth from 2008 in the last 20 years, let's say. Uh, it's been a growth in, in, in bachelors and in masters and also in, in PhDs, which is really good. Um, so today let's talk a bit about why you should join graduate school, why you should not join graduate school, um, why you should do it in CS, um, and then we'll, we'll go over the structure of a PhD and talk a bit about how to do a PhD effectively. Uh, so first of all, let's cover why you should even join or consider uh, joining graduate school. Um, so, grad school, graduate school, and particular, I'm, I'm going to focus mainly on PhDs here. Uh, although, for some things, uh, it does, you know, for for doing a master's, a lot of these things they they do matter, but because of the length is smaller, I think it's there's more challenge and um, more doubts on on a PhD and its structure. So there are a few reasons why you would want uh, uh, to do a PhD. There's not a lot of, it's not suited for everyone. Uh, so usually you're looking for people who have, um, who really are uh, curiosity, cu curious intellectually. They, they do love the challenge of learning and they have a certain culture of always seeking and sharing, which is very important knowledge. Um, as, as a researcher, it's not so much, um, it's almost like halfway or maybe even more. You have to, you have to show something, you have to find a new idea, but a lot of it is communicating that idea. If you, if you have something new, but you can't show, if you can't, uh, make anyone understand it, uh, that idea is not that good or you haven't understood it very well. Um, another important thing about having a PhD or a reason why you, why, why you may want it um, is because the PhD process is really a, a, a specialized degree where you learn a lot of uh, skills such as uh, working by yourself, being autonomous, uh, which is covered in the next one. Um, also being organized and being uh, responsible there's a, it, a lot of it is you working on your own, setting your own goals. Of course, you're, you're, you're talking to an advisor and, and you are being guided, but a lot of it is you trying to define goals and, and meeting those goals uh, for a long period of time. So we're talking about like a five-year project. Um, after you get a PhD, you do get uh, better paying prospects. And this is something I'm going to show you uh, a slide at the end. Uh, another thing that is important or that is nice about doing a PhD um, is that PhD degrees are fully funded so you don't pay anything uh, and indeed you're even paid to do the PhD. Um, so people generally in the most cases are not paying for their own PhD. You'll also get to travel and all that uh, which is something good um, but this I'm going to cover in the next one. Um, you'll get to travel uh, well, assuming there's no pandemic, um, you'll, you'll get to travel. Uh, that's very common for a PhD student to go visit another university and stay there for a while. 
uh, meet other people. There's conferences. Uh, usually a PhD student publishes every year or every other year. So you're expecting to go uh, to another country and do a presentation on a paper and all that. Um, so those are all good reasons. So, uh, but as I mentioned before, PhD is not for everyone. So it, it really, there are a few things that, or some things that you have to keep in mind to figure out if it's something that um, fits your, you know, your, what you want to do. Uh, the first thing is that it's at least, it's around a five year investment of time while you'll be working on the same um, subject or around the same subject for that amount of time. In the first two years, you're probably just doing coursework. Uh, but after that, you have three years of just fully focused on research, uh, always working on the same thing for that span of time. For some people, that's not something interesting, uh, but you do have to to consider that. Um, you will not be paying tuition. So the first point that I'm saying here is that you will not be uh, paying tuition. Um, so what you will be doing is you'll be serving as a teaching assistant. This is very common. Uh, so you'll be doing a bit of work for the department where you'll be helping other undergraduate students sharing your experience and all that. So that's also something to keep in mind. Uh, there is higher workload, especially in the beginning. You have to do, um, the first two years, you have to do um, teaching, right? You have your TA, not teaching, you're, you're assisting uh, you'll be having your courses and you will also be trying to do research. So depending on your, how you, you know, the, the how you want to schedule it with your advisor, but uh, there is a lot to, to juggle, especially in the beginning. Uh, and then things kind of streamline and you're just doing pure research. Uh, but that is something to be aware of. And you are expected to maintain a certain grade, at least at UMass Boston. You have to have a, a high uh, average um, so it's something that you have to take very seriously in terms of teaching uh, or learning. Um, it, you're also required a lot of autonomy. There's no hand-holding. A lot of it, especially at the last year, you're doing something that only you know. So it's not like you can even ask other people because no, no other person in the world will know about what you're, go, like the problem that you're trying to solve. So at some point it it does... Uh, become a bit lonely in that sense. Uh, so that's something you should be aware of uh, while you're pursuing a PhD. Of course, it's not something that happens in the beginning. Um, there is traveling, which for some people is not a good thing, but it's something that you should be expected to do, travel internationally to go to another conference and present your work, uh, but also to join um, summer schools or uh, some small events where you'll be learning with other students. Uh, in, in prestigious um, places. Uh, there will also be, uh, you are also expected to do lots of, lots, uh, to do some presentations. So you have to be able to do public speaking and you have to expect that that's something that should do. I mean, the end of your um, PhD is the defense. Uh, and for that, you have to do a talk and you have to talk a bit about your work and what you're doing. So that's something that will happen a lot while you're doing a PhD. Um, one reason you might want to join a graduate school, um, in particular a PhD, is really because there's a big, um, this is the average salary in payscale.com. I actually went on this website today and the, the values are a bit a bit higher now, but the, the distance between them still holds. So now it's like 131 and whatnot. So it's not that big of a difference. But what you'll see is that there's, you're already getting uh, 20 grand more just by completing a master. So each of these, this is the average pay uh, for a CS with a CS degree. If you have a bachelor's, if you have a master's, and if you have a PhD, as you can see, you get a, a 20K increase by doing a master's on average and a 50K uh, increase on salary by doing a, once you complete your PhD. So basically you go directly to senior positions. Another thing that you might uh, feel fortunate is that you're studying computer science and computer science is the most uh, rewarding um, degree to take. Um, so that's, that's really good. So what you see here on the, on the left is the average salary 
w compare with CS in red compared to all the others uh, in blue. Um, and this is for actually for a masters. And this graph is for the same thing, but for a PhD. And as you can see, it's the most uh, in this in this group, it's the most um, well paid. Okay, so what should you do? So by now you should have some idea. Uh, one key point that I want to make is if you're interested in doing a PhD, um, one very important part of it is you really should be talking to figuring out who you should be working with. And it kind of depends. Some universities, you you apply to the university and then you get, you know, and then you find someone, uh, some advisor uh, within that university. But uh, other times you, you find a person you, you work with uh, before you find the university. And both ways are fine. Uh, but of course, if you can find a supervisor as soon as possible, that is better because ultimately that's who you will be working with uh, for the duration of your PhD. So being paired with someone who you can trust and someone that has is aligned with the same goals and ideals than you, I think that's something very important and crucial even to uh, having a successful and worry-free PhD. Uh, because in the end, it's it's something very, uh, you know, you'll be working with just one person mostly, most of the time, although during your PhD, you will be doing work with other students and so on. But the 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 biggest connection is is with your advisor. So having one that is uh, aligned with what you want to do and has the same like work practices and ideals, I think that's very very important. So talking to them in the beginning before you get um, get into a PhD program, I think that's that's very important to avoid uh, both confusions and and uh, unhappiness. Um, okay, so um, let's say you do assume, you know, you want to to do a PhD, but of course you first want to know what you will do in a PhD. That's what we want to cover now. Um, so a PhD, you have to master a subject, and this means that you have to take some graduate courses. You have to read literature, papers, and books. Mostly papers, though. Um, you will attend conferences, as I mentioned before. Uh, to meet uh, top experts who will be presenting at those conferences and also you will be presenting at those conferences. Um, also to meet future um, bosses, possibly. I, When I was um, doing my PhD, the, the jobs I got after were all due to people I met in conferences or summer schools. Uh, so that's a very important thing to, have to, to be at. Um, and also when you're finishing your PhD, a lot of people use conferences as a place to advertise that they're looking for positions um, to work. Um, then there is uh, this uh, idea of summer schools, which is just, a, think of it as like a one week or two week uh, short workshop where you have top experts, uh, top professors in the world, they will be all in let's say you're a hotel and you'll be att having classes every week, like every week, every day, um, for a week or for two weeks, uh, where you'll be learning uh, the state of the art of some subject. Uh, and this is great because what happens in those summer schools, they're usually in the summer, although there are some winter schools as well. Uh, the great thing about this is that you will be meeting other, co your future colleagues and what you will learn if you continue, do decide to continue, is that while you're doing a PhD, you will meet a group of people, and you're all working in the same field. Uh, a lot of fields in computer science, they're, depending on the field, they might be small. Uh, like if you're working more like AI and that kind of stuff, there's a lot of people working there. But if you're doing uh, other fields in CS, might be much smaller which means that a lot of the people that you'll be meeting, you will be, as students now, will possibly be your colleagues future in the future. So when you're a professor yourself, uh, those will be other people you know. They'll be at the same, le you know, at the same time working in other universities. Uh, so those are great connections to have as soon as possible. Uh, you also have an opportunity to see people, other students, in stages a bit farther ahead. You know, like a two-year student, uh, 
uh, it's very different from a, a first year student uh sorry a complete like a, a beginning third year is much different than a first year and the beginning fifth year is completely different than a beginning first year so meeting students from those different stages of the phd i think that's very useful for for uh, someone who is interested in joining uh, this kind of studies um, it's also a great place to visit universities um, and different cities and, and countries even um, usually all of these conference summer schools are in other either other countries or in other uh, cities usually these are uh, conferences in other places in the world but uh, a lot of conferences have happen also in the US so that also means you a lot of them you'll stay na national. Uh, there's it's also a great opportunity to do out internships during the summer, um, and that's really cool. You can work um, if you're lucky. You can even find a place where you can uh, work on your PhD study while you're doing um, while you're being paid by a company. Uh, and this is good for two reasons. First, because you're advancing your PhD, and secondly, also because you're getting connections when you finish your PhD, you might want to join those places. So that's uh, there's internships in all top places like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft. They all have these, and they're always excited to have PhD students there. Um, so this is, yeah, when you do a PhD, you kind of enter this new new kind of world where you have a lot of these kinds of opportunities. That, that's really good. Um, one thing I, I wrote here is peer-reviewed scientific papers. I think you know what that is, but if you don't, it's just uh, the idea of peer-reviewed scientific papers. Just you submit a paper uh, and other scientists will read it and will make sure if, if it's at the level of quality that they're, they're expecting, uh, they will suggest some changes. And then you, if you commit those changes everyone's happy and you submit and you publish that paper in a, in a conference um, sometimes you also have like posters uh, usually in the beginning of the phd that's what uh, phd students will be doing uh, posters that will be presenting um, okay so so this is all about mastering a subject so there are multiple ways so in short you have uh, your graduate courses you have uh, reading papers you have attending conferences and summer schools. This is all just to know the state of the art. So you get to know the state of the art. Uh, all of these um, things in, in, in bold are just ways of mastering the state of the art of a certain subject. So then how do you advance the state of the art? Well, that's the last three years of your PhD, right? The idea is you, you, you synthesize that, uh, that work of those three years in this PhD thesis manuscript. Um, and the PhD thesis manuscript should contain two things. First of all, it should be new, right? The contribution that you're working on has to be new, but it also has to mean something. It has to have some impact to society, to society right? So it's not something that you do because you want and it's completely useless. Although sometimes it's fine. Uh, it kind of depends on the field as well. But in computer science, because it's more of an applied uh, field, uh, we tend to care more about where you apply that. Um, and the kind of skills you need to have is, of course, exploring, investigating, contemplating, conceptualizing problems, finding issues, troubleshooting, backtracking, all that kind of stuff where you have to um, really abstract, uh, try to figure out how you you solve a certain problem in a novel, novel way that is actually faster. And actually now with uh, the pandemic, there's actually a good thing is that there's a lot of uh, resources online, like um, workshops on, on being a, a successful PhD um, that usually uh, are available, recently have been made available in, in conferences, but now because a lot of conferences are virtual and they're also free, um, they're published on YouTube and you can find them very easily. And if you don't find them, you can contact me, I will make them uh, available to you. So at this point, second stage of your PhD, you've ad you advanced the state of the art, you now become a world expert on a certain subject. Um, so pictorially, and I really like this, this is by Matt Might. you have the link here if you want to follow it. Um, and so this is, let's say you start 
where, where after you finish your bachelor's, you're like this, uh, where the colorful thing is what you know. This is all the human knowledge. Uh, so once you complete the courses, you're probably here um, in terms of knowledge. There's still a lot to learn, right? Um, so then you start mastering them, right? You start reading your papers, start going to conferences, you you start figuring a lot of stuff out. So at this point, you've mastered the state of the art, right? You're right here. Um, and then you have to zoom in. <laughs> Once you finish your PhD, you kind of advance the state of the art just a little bit. Uh, it kind of looks small in the big picture, but it's still an improvement, and that's what we were looking for. So, as you can see, it's the whole progress that matters, like what you've learned in your experience. You've, you're basically learning to learn and to try um, to, to s solve problems in an abstract way. That's mostly what a PhD is about. Uh, the contributions are usually, they're good, but they're never going to be something. It's not like we're in the beginning of a field. Um, so one thing that is very important, um, as I mentioned before, is really this connection between a PhD student and the advisor. So it's, it's kind of important to figure out the boundaries and, and what you're expected to do and what your advisor is expected to do. So I kind of like this uh, five plus five commandments, again, by Matt Might. Uh, and Matt uh, did it with other people here. Uh, but what I like about it is that it kind of divides and gives you like five top level things that an advisor and a PhD student should do. So what the advisor should do is the advisor should, of course, advise the student, right? Find the thesis topic, uh, teach how to research, uh, teach how to write papers, teach how to give talks, right? So all the instruments of being a researcher. The advisor should also protect the student, um, protect the student in terms of funding concerns. The, the student shouldn't be worried about how they're getting uh, paid and all that. That's, that's the role of the advisor. Um, the advisor should also inform the student in terms of goals, in terms of, you know, career prospects. And um, the student has a question in terms of, oh, should I do this or X or Y? Um, the advisor is not expected to know everything, of course, but they should give them um, an experienced look on pros and cons so that the student can can decide then from themselves. Um, it should also, it's very important like in the beginning of your work as a PhD student uh, to be guided there uh, because you know you, you, you don't know what a PhD is so it's very, the advisor has this really important role of, of framing and setting the direction in which you should go. Uh, and, and really, this is something that naturally happens. The PhD student starts with something, could be a small idea or something a bit bigger. Uh, but basically, the PhD student starts working on something, and then they start diverging and diverging, and then eventually they start working on something new, and they're on their own. And that's kind of it work, how it works. But the role of the, the advisor there is kind of making sure you start in a place that has a good you know, a good path for you to kind of diverge. Even if you diverge, you're still kind of guided in between a frame of sensibility. <laughs> um, okay, so this is also in terms of understanding uh, where you are and, you know, in each time of a PhD, what you should be working on, because there are some things that make more sense to work in the beginning, but don't make as much sense to work uh, while you're four years in. So those kinds of things are it's, that's the role of the advisor. They are the ones who are, who have the experience in the and the you know the the bird's eye view to figure out how things should be done. So what a PhD student should do is first of all, and this is very important, something that some people forget, is they should get educated about career uh, the career prospects as a post PhD. So for instance, in my hometown. Uh, being a P, uh, having a PhD in computer science is basically worthless because there are no jobs <laughs> there. So where I where I grew, it was kind of useless. I I mean, if I wanted to continue work, living there, which I didn't, so um, that's why I moved out. So you you want to know what you what you can do once you finish a, P, a postdoc. So you sorry a PhD. So you want to uh, search for career opportunities, figure out what you can do as a PhD. 
uh, versus what you can do as a master's and see if, is that aligned to what you want to do? Um, and this is the second key point, right? You want to make sure that out of all of these options, do you want to be a professor? Do you want to be a senior software engineer in, in Google or something like that? Do you, do you care about that or not? Maybe you, you don't care about or, or the kind of job you want maybe doesn't require a PhD and maybe you don't need to get it. Uh, remember that is a, a long-term investment, right? A five-year investment at least. So just make sure you, you know what you would, or, or at least are aware of what you can do after you finish your PhD and whether those match what you want to do. Um, and also remember that uh, a PhD student has to be aware that a, a PhD is not just research. There's there's coursework, there's the qualifying exams, there's the whole part of writing a thesis, and some people are not very interested in that. And also, um, even in terms of research, there's the whole point where you're working on the same subject for a long time, which is not very appealing to a lot of people. Um, another thing that a PhD student has to learn to do, or at least be willing to do, is first of all, work hard, and also, maintain a rhythm, be focused, and basically get this very particular work ethics uh, of getting a PhD. Um, the last thing a PhD student has to do is you have to be responsible to understand what you have to do. And that's something that is between mostly the PhD student and um, the department, right? So you have these credits, uh, how many credits you need to pass, blah, 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 all that stuff. That's between the PhD student and the department. And the responsibility lays on the PhD student. Um, so that's mostly what I wanted to talk about, how to pursue a PhD effectively. Um, so now I'm going to take a bit, in the next video, I'm going to talk a bit about the research uh, in my research group.